In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This evening in the life of the church, we celebrate the Feast of All Saints Day. This is one of the seven principal feasts of the church, ranks right up there with Christmas and Easter, though you would not be able to tell given the difference in attendance. But they're all seven of them equally important. On this specific day, we gather together to celebrate the glorious communion of saints. One of the great truths of the Christian faith is that death has been undone in Christ. The gates of Hades torn asunder by God's love. And so to Christians, life is simply changed, not ended when we die. And so as a symbol of that belief, at the beginning of our service tonight, we ask the saints to join our prayers. As those great women and men of our faith, those who have gone before, continue ever deeper into the love of our God, we ask their prayers for our journey here on earth. And we hope that the witness of all the saints to what life in Christ truly entails, that this will inspire us to greater faithfulness in our own lives. This is why today is one of the four days given in the prayer book is especially appropriate for baptism. Recognizing the importance of the glorious company of saints, it makes sense that this would be a particularly important day to welcome members into that communion here on this mortal plane. And if there are no baptisms like this evening, then we will all renew our own baptismal covenant. We will renew our commitment to living life differently than the world around us. Our commitment to let the fire of God's grace burn in our own hearts to make us ever more like the great saints of the church. If you've ever come to the Wednesday noon service of Holy Eucharist and Healing, you've gotten the delight of hearing lots of different stories of saints, the breadth of our church's calendar. And even if that's not something you come to, it's likely you've probably heard a story or two about different saints in the Christian church. Perhaps you've heard the story of St. Francis taming the wolf at Gubbio. Or you know about Padre Pio and the stigmata. There are all of these fantastic stories of saints and they're a joy to share. And so today we celebrate those saints we remember in those stories. Names sung in the litany that are familiar to you. But we don't just celebrate those saints known to us through story and legend or even through our church's calendar. In fact, one of the reasons for the celebration of All Saints Day is the recognition of the church that our ability to name and articulate who exactly is a saint is inevitably flawed. And so All Saints Day exists to ensure we catch everyone else we may have missed. After all, culture, tradition, social class, all sorts of expectations color our ability to truly recognize the saints of God. And so the Feast of All Saints is a day set aside for all the saints, not just the ones we know, not just the ones we remember. It's a feast that's meant to cause us to pause, to remember that there have always been saints, holy ones whose lives have reached such perfection through God's grace that they perfectly mirror Christ to the world. And that there are some out there who have been saints and were known to God alone because the church found herself unable to see them. All of this sort of begs the question, of course, of just who, le who really is a saint? How do we recognize who the saints are? The Roman tradition is that the saints are those who have achieved the beatific vision, those who, through the grace of God, have become truly who they are and have therefore fully entered into the divine life. The Orthodox Church believes similarly. But in both traditions, what's important to remember is that when the Church declares someone a saint, it is not the Church making them a saint. Rather, it is the Church recognizing what has become apparent, that this person truly was someone who would reach the fullness of who we are called to be as Christ. Now, I know in Anglican Christianity, there are probably just as many opinions on saints as there are Anglicans. It's one of the funny things about our Church. <laughs> But it's kind of interesting that the Anglican tradition from her earliest days, even at the height of Reformation fervor, maintained 
calendars of saints. Maintain this idea that there are people to whom we can look as models of the Christian faith. In the midst of these variously nuanced traditions regarding the saints, then the church also gives us our gospel reading for today. And in this reading, Jesus talks about who the truly blessed ones, the truly beatified. And we, aware that the task of determining sainthood is far from an exact science, gathered in this evening to celebrate those saints who the church may have overlooked in its official processes, we hear Jesus in this text offer us some direction as to who exactly are the ones whom God favors. And what does he tell us? Blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who are hungry. Blessed are those who weep. Those who are blessed by God, according to Jesus in the gospel at least, are the poor, the hungry, those with pain deep in their hearts. What a bizarre text to be given on All Saints Day. What are we to do with this text on a day when we commemorate the saints, look to them as concrete models, as examples of what life in Christ entails? I mean, does the text mean perhaps we should all become poor, hungry, and sad? I certainly hope not. I don't think that's what Jesus is indicating here. Instead, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is consistently exploring the question of sight, asking who it is that can truly see the reign of God that is breaking in through his ministry. And in Luke's Gospel, those who often have the best sight tend to be the poor, the hungry, and those who weep. For some reason, the difficulty of, the, of their life enables them to see Jesus more clearly than the comfortable ever will. In Luke's gospel, those on the margin see the reign of God much better than those in the mainstream. So perhaps it's good to recognize on this great feast that our vision is not as clear as we might think it is. We should admit that none of us see the reign of God and its implications with perfection, that we need others particularly the communion of saints, to show us the kingdom of God. And with the words from Luke in our ears, we should be particularly careful to look to the poor, the hungry, and those who mourn, recognizing they can help us see God and God's reign in manners that are beyond our knowing. This is why the litany of saints in this service is ever expanding. If you look at the traditional Roman litany of the saints, you will find it tends to heavily favor men and clergy. But our litany of the saints recognizes that in the Episcopal Church, sainthood is much broader. And so our litany seeks specifically to make clear the several women, the marginalized, the way that all the baptized have been saints in their own time, heroes and exemplars of the faith, even if the institutional structures of the church failed to recognize it. And I hope you'll take a moment, take some time, whether this evening or later this week, to take your bulletin home with you, to look up some of those stories. Stories like, like Florence Litim Oi, the first woman ordained a priest in our communion. Barbara Harris, the first bishop, the first woman ordained a bishop in our communion. All of these great people who stood up, for, who claimed their identity as saints of God when the church was a little unsure of their propriety. Indeed, one of the glorious truths of the communion of saints is the saints tend to be rather improper, rather regularly, which should push the church just ever so little to ask if we have become too proper, too content, and too comfortable if we should perhaps be a little more unsettling as well. Because, beloved of God, if through the stories of the saints, bolstered by the prayers of those who are with us here and those who are gone before, if we can begin to see the reign of God with greater clarity, then I think our actions will indeed bend more towards that kingdom. Then Jesus' admonition at the end of the reading will begin to take shape in our own life. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. 
From anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give, give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, don't ask for them again. That's what it actually means to do to others as you would have them to do. This is not a saying to be embroidered on a pillow and left on a couch. Do to others as you would have them do to you is meant to provoke you to recognize the inherent dignity of every person, even to recognize the dignity of your oppressor and to call them to something more. And so much of that probably seems beyond most of us and possibly, impossibly, and incredibly hard. And it is. But the saints remind us that it is possible. That if you will give yourself to the love of God, it is possible to love in ways you could never love on your own. The stories of the saints teach us that if we pattern our lives after these admonitions, loving our enemies, being kind to those who are difficult, blessing those who wish us harm, never striking back in vindication, always giving to those in need, if we can pattern our lives after these admonitions, we'll find that the things that kept us from doing those, the fear of what we'd lose if we did, that those fears were unfounded. Because a life lived in this way is one that understands, one that has clarity of sight of God's reign, one that realizes that in Christ we already have the kingdom of God, the glorious company of saints and light. What else more could we need? So why would we not give up for the sake of God's love? Amen. Amen.